in chemistry, you are looking at the different compounds and how they react. There are 118 elements on the periodic table, and these elements can combine in a number of different ways to make all of these compounds. And knowing what the names of all of these compounds are is crucial to know uh, what you or someone else is talking about. The way that chemical compounds are named is very specific. And this lab focuses on na not only naming the varying different compounds, but also looking at a number of the different properties of different areas on the periodic table, the different compounds that come from different areas on the table. You're looking at compounds that will be focusing on the pre-transition metals. You'll look at compounds focusing on the transition metals. You'll look at compounds that are specifically either acidic or basic. And going through this, looking to see how they react, which areas of the table are more soluble than others, and which area of the table shows the greatest amount of different colors is important in knowing what types of chemicals there are and how they would be named. Chemical nomenclature is a way to convert different chemical formulas into a standardized name. There are thousands and thousands of different chemical compounds all different types of elements that are bound together through different chemical bonds and there is a standard way to name them so there uh, it can avoid a lot of different confusion calling something mangane magnesium chloride versus chloride magnesium can cause quite a bit of uh, confusion. So in order to do this, there is a standard way to name all of these different chemical compounds. In this course and in the next semester, all, the majority of things that you would be working with are inorganic compounds. That is different chemical compounds that do not involve a lot of carbon uh, atoms. And most of them happen through ionic bonds with a metal and a nonmetal. And then some would happen through different covalent bonds with multiple different nonmetal elements. And each one has its own style of naming. If you move on to more advanced chemistry uh, courses, uh, such as organic chemistry, there is a st standard and stylized way to name specific compounds. This compound that's shown right here is a molecule of caffeine. That's the common name for it, and it has the chemical formula C8H10N4O2. But in the standardized naming system, this chemical compound would be known as 1,3,7-trimethylpurine-2,6-dione. In this way, anyone can look at this chemical formula and piece together this exact chemical structure. And in this, uh, this course, uh, first year chemistry, that's why the chemical naming system is what it is. You can look at the name and specifically determine what is the actual chemical structure based on the name. So all of these uh, elements and all of these molecules in this course, or at least for the uh, the majority of them deal with the ions. You're taking the different elements and generating uh, ions from them, especially in these labs where you're looking at different solutions of compounds. And so when you take 
a uh, or form an ion of one of these elements, you're changing the number of valence electrons. You're either adding additional valence electrons or removing some of those valence electrons. Most of the times, uh, metals will lose some electrons, and that would form a positive charge. Electrons themselves have a negative charge on them, so when you take that off, you're left with a positively charged ion, and that would be considered a cation. Nonmetals uh, are able to gain extra electrons. They are highly electronegative and want to bring in additional electrons. And that extra negative charge means that the ion itself will be a negative ion, and that would be considered a cation. All of the, the majority of the different groupings have a standard charge associated or a standard uh, number of electrons that will either be gained or lost. All alkali metals, for example, will lose one electron. So its ions or their ions will have a plus one charge. Alkaline earth metals will lose two electrons and have a plus two charge. When you get to the main block of elements over here, there are both metals and nonmetals. The metals will lose some electrons and generate a positive charge, while the nonmetals can gain electrons and generate a negative charge. So in group three, these elements, aluminum through uh, thallium, could lose either a one, one electron and have a one plus charge or three electrons and have a three plus charge. Uh, group 4A or group 14, particularly tin and lead, could either lose two electrons or four electrons. Bismuth could lose three or five. Polonium could lose uh, four or six. And then in the nonmetals, these are what's gaining electrons. So the halogens in particular have uh, seven valence electrons to start, so they want to gain one additional electron, and that will form a negative one charge. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, particularly oxygen, would gain two electrons for a negative two charge. Nitrogen could gain three electrons for uh, a negative three charge. Carbon and boron can kind of go either way. In the transition metals, these are all metals that will lose electrons and form a positively charged cation, but the number of electrons that they lose can vary widely. Some things like zinc and cadmium over here will typically always lose two electrons. Copper can lose either one or two electrons. Silver typically only loses one. Iron can lose two or three. And some of the elements can lose multiple different electrons and react with things in a number of different ways. So knowing which type of element is very crucial. And that is uh, included when you're naming things with the transition metals. So first you can look at these combinations of metals and nonmetals. These are coming together through the electrostatic interaction, a positive charge and a negative charge. This is ionic bonding. You have the two charged materials or two charged ions that are coming together and forming that bond, particularly just because opposites attract. These ionic bonds typically can dissolve in water, at least depending on their solubility. Things like sodium chloride, magnesium nitride, aluminum chloride, these are ionic compounds and dissolve in water. And when they do dissolve, it's they're broken apart into their individual ions. 
So to determine the actual chemical formula, you're looking at these standard charges of the different uh, elements or the different ions, knowing that alkali metals would always have a plus one, alkaline earth metals always have a plus two, halogens always have a minus one, and particularly oxygen always has a minus two and nitrogen always has a minus three. The rest can vary a bit. So you would look at the positive charge and the negative charge and try to balance them out. In the case of sodium, it's one positive charge. So you need one negative charge to balance it out. Chloride happens to have a one negative charge. So there, the compound itself, only contains one sodium and one chlorine. Magnesium has a two plus charge while nitrogen has a three minus charge. So to cancel those out, you're looking at the least common multiple. And that would be six. You would need three magnesium ions at two plus and two nitrogens at three minus to balance each other out, making sure that there's the same number of positives and the same number of negatives. When you're naming these compounds, this combination of a metal and a non-metal, the metal name goes first. So sodium, magnesium, aluminum, these are the metal ions and that's what's listed first in the name and what's listed first in the chemical formula. The non-metal would be listed second and has the suffix of IDE. So the chlorine atom as an ion would be a chloride ion. The nitrogen atom as an ion would be the nitride ion. When you have a mixture of different non-metals, you're looking at multiple non-metal components. These are bonds that form where the electrons between the two are being shared. And these are covalent bonds. The electrons from both elements are blended in between, forming a bond between the two atoms. These types of bonds will not break apart in water. They are fixed. And many of the polyatomic ions, which we'll go over next, are made of all of these covalently bonded uh, non-metals. And that's why they don't break apart in water. So when you're naming something that is a combination of two non-metals, you're typically looking at the central atom and the terminal atoms, looking at what is that atom or uh, the atom where there's only one of that particular kind. That would be uh, named first, and it's the full name. All of the atoms that are surrounding it are second. And just as with the metal-nonmetal combinations, the second uh, element has that suffix, that I-D-E or I'd suffix at the end. So nitrogen and iodide. But with non-metals, there could be multiple different combinations. So in order to name those different combinations specifically, the name itself has prefixes in front of each uh, different element name. And that prefix indicates how many of them there are. Uh, in most situations, the mono prefix of one usually isn't used, but could be, but usually, uh, usually isn't necessarily used. But in the case of this one, Ni3, there's one nitrogen, three iodines. So that would be nitrogen, because there's only one tri-iodide. So it's ending with that suffix and there are three iodines. So the prefix is tri. Other things like carbon tetrachloride, one carbon, four chloride ions. 
And these prefixes also are used in that first name. So in the case of this, P2O5, there are two phosphorus atoms and five oxygen atoms. So that would be diphosphorus pentoxide, five oxygens. And many times just for uh, kind of aesthetics and just kind of the flow of the words, uh, the A's at the end of most of these prefixes are dropped in oxygen because penta oxide would be very, is a little more cumbersome. So that's typically dropped and you have something like pentoxide or heptoxide. I mentioned uh, a little bit ago about polyatomic ions and these are groups of covalently bonded nonmetals. And these groups of nonmetals themselves have a charge, typically a negative charge. But in the case of the ammonium ion, it is a positive charge. These are the standard polyatomic ions. And these are names that you should get used to and should know in chemistry, looking at them, if you are dealing with a carbonate, you should know that it's one carbon, three oxygens, and has a two minus charge. These different uh, specific polyat polyatomic groups, when they react or when they combine with uh, a different ion, typically uh, a positively charged metal ion, they are named as their whole. So in the case of aluminum nitrate, aluminum has a three plus charge. Nitrate, looking here, has a one minus charge. So it will take three of these whole groups to balance out that three plus aluminum. And because of that, when you're writing the chemical formula, the entire nitrate group, that NO3, is placed in parentheses because you have three of the entire group. And when you're working through these, there's no die or try, and you're naming it as the entire group second because this is the anion. In the case of ammonium, that is the cation, the positively charged anion, or the positively charged cation, so that is listed first, such as, as in ammonium hydroxide, NH4OH. You'll notice many of these polyatomic ions deal with oxygen. There's a lot of oxygens involved in almost all of them. And there's a standardized way to look at those. So taking chlorate, for example, chlorate is ClO3 minus. But there are different polyatomic ions that have varying degrees of oxygen, all with that same negative charge. So if chlorate is the standard one, ClO3, perchlorate, has one more oxygen. So this prefix here, perchlorate, ClO4, still only one minus. Chlorite has one less oxygen. So it goes from ClO3 minus to ClO2 minus. And hypochlorite is two less. So ClO minus. And all of these types of oxygen-based polyatomic ions have this same structure. So in the case of sulfate, SO4 two minus, you would be able to determine the name of the SO5 two minus, two minus ion. That would be the per sulfate ion. SO3 two minus, that would be the sulfite ion. And same thing with nitrate, it's NO3, that's the standard, uh, standard polyatomic ion, but you can also have nitrite, which is NO2 minus, 
or per nitrate, which is NO4 minus. That same naming system is consistent for all of these types of atoms and polyatomic ions. I had mentioned a bit earlier about the transition metals where they have these varying charge or these varying charges. And you can see that in the case of vanadium. These are all different uh, vanadium oxygen compounds. And just by varying or changing the number of electrons that were removed from the vanadium ion, the appearance and the chemistry of them, uh, this particular ion itself, will change. And there needs to be a way to indicate what type of vanadium it is. is, is the, does the vanadium have a five plus charge, a four plus charge, three plus or two plus? And this is done when utilizing um, the transition metals or uh, tin and lead also have two different charges that can be used. So it's done with Roman numerals. And the Roman numeral indicates the charge on the metal ion. So iron 2 chloride means that it's using the Fe2 plus ion. Iron 3 chloride indicates that it's using the Fe3 plus ion. The Roman numeral is telling you in words or in the name, what is the actual charge of the different uh, transition metal. Because it's iron two, that's a two plus charge, and it's chloride, that means there needs to be two of the one minus chlorides to balance that out. With iron three, there needs to be three one minus chlorides to balance that out. In something like vanadium four oxide, VO2, the vanadium is seen to be in the four plus state. That's this bluish light blue teal uh, compound right here. And to obtain four plus out of oxygens, you need two of them. Each oxygen is two minus. So to make up for that four plus, you need two of them. For a total of four minus coming from oxygen and four plus coming from that one vanadium. An older method of naming, particularly in these transition metals, is using a suffix a suffix on the name of the metal itself, either ick or us. So in the case of cobalt, you have the full name with us or ick, cobaltus chloride or cobaltic chloride. And these really just indicate, particularly when there's two different uh, charge states or two different standard uh, charges, on the particular metal. The ick is the, the charge, the higher number charge. So, and the us is the lower number charge. So something like iron, iron two plus that has a two charge and iron three plus has a three charge. The three is higher, so that's ick, and the two is lower, so that's us. You may see this from time to time, and in particularly with uh, lead and tin, because there are two different charge states that these could be in, it also uses the older naming system derived from the uh, chemical, the atomic symbol, plumbus or plumbic chlorides or stannous and stannic chloride. Where this is really used 
still most of the time, if you're looking at compounds, you'd be seeing them in the standardized uh, name using the Roman numerals. The one element that still seems to use this particular naming system a little more frequently is iron. So you will see uh, ferric compounds and ferrous compounds. So the ferric compounds are using Fe3+, and the ferrous compounds are using Fe2+. Something else that happens, uh, again, many times with, with transition metals, is the hydration of that compound itself. So when you have a compound that is hydrated, that means there is water, there are, there are water molecules already contained in that solid material. So in the case of copper sulfate, you can have copper sulfate pentahydrate. So here's that uh, prefix again, indicating the number. Five hydrates, there are five water molecules along with one copper sulfate. So if it's written out in words, copper to sulfate pentahydrate, you have copper to sulfate, CuSO4, and pentahydrate. There are five water molecules. When you would be looking at the full molecular weight of the compound and looking at a hydrate, the mass of this water, all five of them, is included. And if it was just the pure compound and it does not mention any sort of hydration level, that would be an anhydrous compound, meaning no water. So copper sulfate, pure copper sulfate anhydrous has a molecular weight of 159.61 grams per mole. There is one copper, one sulfur, and four oxygens. But copper sulfate pentahydrate has one copper, one sulfur, the four oxygens from the sulfate, but also five oxygens from the water and five times two hydrogens from the water for a total molecular weight of 249.69 grams per mole. And you can see this in a lab quite often, the hydrated uh, compounds, uh, especially ones that have a color already associated with them, those ones in the transition metals have more color associated with their different uh, they're different compounds. The splitting of those d orbital electrons causes uh, energy transitions and energy changes in the visible region of the spectrum. So that's why you're seeing more colors associated with transition metal compounds. They're coming from the d orbital transitions. So when you see that, these hydrated samples are, are much more darker and more vibrant color versus the anhydrous samples, which are very pale and almost pastel-like. One of the last portions of naming is dealing with acids. In chemistry labs, you will be working with different types of acids and some different types of bases. An acid is something where the counter ion, the cation, the positively charged ion, is the hydrogen ion, H+. Pure acid is the H plus ion. If you're looking at measuring the acidity of a solution or measuring how much acid is actually in a solution, you're measuring how much H plus is actually in that solution. And there are a number of different common acids that you would probably see in many different um, chemistry labs. Hydrochloric acid, HCl, that's probably the most common, but also phosphoric acid, H3PO4, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, nitric acid, HNO3, and acetic acid, which is a carbon-based acid of H3CO. OOH, that COOH portion is 
the acid uh, molecule. That H can break off, but these three can't. So you can look at naming these acids or naming different types of acids by looking at the anion itself. And with that differing level of oxygens in many of those anions, its acid name is also slightly different. So if chlorate is the name of the anion, the name of the acid is chloric acid. So anything with an eight suffix on the anion will have an ic suffix in the acid, chloric acid. Uh, any prefixes remain. Perchlorate will generate perchloric acid when it's combined with an H plus ion. Any of the ites, I-T-E, so chlorite ion, will change to the suffix O-U-S. So the chlorite ion will form chlorous acid, H-C-L-O-2. And hypochlorite, C-L-O minus, will form hypochlorous acid. In terms of base, there's not as many bases uh, that are typically used a lot, but or at least these types of inorganic uh, bases that you would see in general chemistry labs, mostly either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Those are the very strong acids, but another one is ammonia. And that's used relatively frequently in different uh, labs because of its particular properties with the nitrogen. Pure ammonia by itself, NH3 is a gas but that gas can also be dissolved in water. And that liquid solution, which would be termed aqueous ammonia, aqueous meaning water, reacts with the water molecules themselves and it forms ammonium hydroxide, NH4OH. Many times you may see the, uh, these two names used interchangeably here or there, aqueous ammonia and ammonium hydroxide. So when you're looking through and looking at different formulas, you can see all of the different names that uh, can be associated with it just by seeing the chemical formula and knowing what name would be used with what chemical formula is very helpful and useful in a chemistry lab where many times things might be labeled just as a chemical formula and knowing that full name can give you a lot of information about the compound itself. This experiment focuses on how individual atoms come together to create molecules and how these molecules look, their different shape, their different structures, and how they're oriented in space. So these chemical structures are three-dimensional. They exist in all three dimensions of space, but there needs to be ways to represent them on paper. So if you are writing out a structure, there are different ways to do that. So this example here are all of the different ways the chemical of ethanol can be represented by simply um, listing every single atom and connecting them. Uh, shorthand where carbons and hydrogens typically aren't written, three-dimensional structures using models, and different representations on how the bonds come together and how they're related in space looking through one of the chemical bonds. The two-dimensional way we're going to look at uh, chemical structures in this exercise is through Lewis structures. And it's a way to look at a, a molecule while taking into account every single electron that is available to undergo a, reaction, a reaction. 
So Lewis structures use, utilize valence electrons, and these are the electrons in the outermost energy level, the electrons that have the most energy and therefore will be the ones that undergo any sort of chemical reaction. And typically these are the orbitals in the S, or the, the electrons in the S orbital and P orbital. And one way to look at this to figure out how many valence electrons an, uh, an element has is to look at the periodic table. Using the periodic table, you can see how many valence electrons each element has based on its position. So this is typical for the main group elements, so not the transition uh, elements. So looking at pre-transition and post-transition. You can tell the number of valence electrons by the group or column that it's in. So in group number one, the alkali metals, each of these elements has one valence electron. Group two, the alkaline earth metals, each of these elements has two valence electrons. Group 3A, or group 13, if you go all the way through, there are three valence electrons in all of these elements. And that's how you can tell how many total valence electrons there are in the main block of elements. So once you have all of the uh, valence electrons counted for each of the individual atoms, to determine the total number of valence electrons present in a molecule, you just add them all together. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going through three different, ele or three different compounds and showing how to generate these different Lewis structures. So in the case of methane, there's one carbon. It's in group four, which has four valence electrons. And there are four hydrogens, each having one uh, from group one, each having one valence electron for a total of eight. Sulfur dioxide, both sulfur and oxygen are in group six. So each of them contains six valence electrons. So there are six total from the one sulfur, 12 total from the two oxygens, so 18 valence electrons total. Uh, same as with, so with the one nitrogen in group five, six oxygens in group uh, six in the nitrate ion. But when you're dealing with ions, ions are a differing number of electrons. If it's a negative anion, like the nitrate ion, that means there is one extra electron there. So you have to add that in to the total number of, of electrons. So nitrate ion has a total of 24 valence electrons. So the first thing is to draw out the overall structure, looking to see what atom would be in the middle and what things would be around it, what, ele or what uh, atoms would surround that central atom, and just basically make an overall structure. Next, you know that each of these terminal atoms, these ones surrounding the central atom, are bound to the central atom. And each chemical bond needs at least two electrons. So, you can go through and for each bond that you know is happening, you can put in two electrons. Now I have uh, a starting point of a Lewis structure for these three compounds. Methane itself though, only started out with eight valence electrons. All eight of these valence electrons are used up. So this is the full complete structure for methane. There are still uh, electrons to be used for sulfur dioxide and the nitrate ion. So these are not complete Lewis structures yet. One thing that's very important 
when writing or when drawing Lewis structures is the octet rule. And this is the general rule that atoms prefer to have a total of eight electrons surrounding them, either in the form of lone pairs or bonds. So if you look at this methane example, carbon has eight electrons surrounding it, two electrons in each of these bonds. Now there are uh, some exceptions to the octet rule, but mostly for the chemistry that uh, you'll be working with, um, the octet rule is followed. But some of the simple, uh, very small elements can't support eight electrons, they're too small. So hydrogen only has one electron to begin with and only one proton. There's no p orbital. Hydrogen can only have two valence electrons. Lithium and beryllium are also very small, but they do have a few more electrons available to them than hydrogen, so they can hold four. Boron does have or is part of the p orbital, but it's very, very small. So cannot support eight, can only hold um, six. The other thing is for very, very large elements. The, these large elements involve the d orbitals and can utilize those electrons to have five pairs or six pairs, so 10 or 12 electrons uh, surrounding it. But typically, what you're going to be looking at are things like uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, these sorts of things will have and will follow the octet rule. And most of the, uh, the halogens, fluor uh, fluorine, chlorine, these will follow the, the octet rule. Couple of examples here, beryllium difluoride is too small. It can only support four. Boron trifluoride, also too small, can only support six. Iodine and sulfur are large, heavy atoms. If you look at the periodic table, they have a lot of electrons around them. They're very, very large. So iodine itself can support up to five pairs or 10 electrons. Sulfur can support up to six, but each in each case, they can have fewer. These are just the maximum uh, electrons that they can support. So going back to our uh, examples, we want to figure out how to arrange all of the total electrons available so that the octet rule is satisfied for each of the elements that are there. So in the case of sulfur dioxide, we there were a total of 18 electrons. Four of them were used just to hook these two oxygens onto the sulfur. That means there are 14 left. So the next step after you've uh, put in the electrons for each of the bonds is to start going around these terminal atoms and writing in all of the other electrons trying to fill these in to satisfy the octet rule. So you put in two, 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 all the way around the other oxygens. And what you'll find out is that they don't always satisfy the octet rule. You put these all in and the sulfur ends up with only six. But it needs to satisfy that octet rule. This means there's too few electrons there. This is an indication that there is a double bond present. And when you have a double bond present in a, a bonding pair of atoms, one of, you can move one of these lone pairs of electrons that are on the oxygen and shift it to being the second uh, bond tied with sulfur. So now this sulfur dioxide has a final Lewis structure of this. Each, uh, all 18 electrons are utilized and each of the three atoms has eight electrons surrounding it. The sulfur and one of the oxygens are sharing not two, 
but they are sharing four electrons as the result of a double bond. The same is true with the nitrate ion. You go in, you put all of these electrons in, but you can't forget to put in the one electron extra because this is an ion that can be thrown in really anywhere. And you'll notice that uh, as long as it satisfies an octet rule, um, you'll notice again, there is a space where this particular oxygen does not satisfy the octet rule. That means there needs to be a shift. So the nitrogen is already bonding to two other oxygens as well as that oxygen, but there is one additional lone pair of electrons that could be utilized to generate a double bond with one of these oxygens. So as you're going through and writing different Lewis structures, you're going to see how things interact with each other, where there are double bonds, and uh, in many in cases like this, where the double bond actually is does not uh, necessarily matter when drawing the Lewis structure. So in a case like this, in the nitrate ion, the double bond happens to be on one of these oxygens. It could be on any of these three oxygens. They are all equivalent. And that would be the concept of resonance. There are three different ways to draw this Lewis structure. So as mentioned, uh, molecules are three-dimensional. While there are many ways to represent them on paper, they do exist in a three-dimensional structure. Uh, however, they're a little small and you can't actually see with your eyes how the atoms are hooked together. But there are a number of different uh, theories on how the electron, or how the atoms come together and form these molecules and what the overall shape of them would be. One of these uh, theories on how mo uh, molecules look is the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory or VSEPR, which is usually pronounced as VSEPR. So this is based on the fact that electrons are negatively charged. So the bonds uh, which are made up of electrons are negatively charged and they repel each other. So they want to be as far away from each other as possible. So assuming all of those are around the central atom, uh, both bonds and lone pairs of electrons, you would use geometry to have all of these electron groups around the central atom in uh, the geometric way where they're all as far apart from each other as possible. So there are a number of different shapes that can come from this. The simplest would be a linear structure. So if there are two electron groups, that means there is either two bonds or one bond and one lone pair of electrons, just two groups of electrons, you would have a linear structure. The farthest uh, distance that two groups of electrons could be on a spherical molecule or a spherical atom would be on opposite sides, directly across from each other with a full bond angle of 180 degrees. So this would be the simplest shape. When you have three electron groups, so that is three total bonds or two bonds and one lone pair of electrons, just three groups of electrons, the farthest geometrically they could be is in a flat plane, 120 degrees away from each other. Each of these angles would be 120 degrees. And geometrically, that's as far apart from each other as they can be. So if there, and this is trigonal planar, 
trigonal, meaning three or a triangle, and planar, it's a flat molecule. Now, there are two different types of geometry. There is the electronic geometry, and then there is the molecular shape. And the difference between them is whether or not you count lone pairs of electrons. So in this case, the electronic geometry includes lone pairs of electrons. So in both of these images, it's a trigonal planar geometry. So there are three electron groups around the central atom. So therefore, based on its electrons, the structure is trigonal planar. But lone pairs of electrons are not atoms. So if you're looking at just the atoms themselves, that would give you the molecular shape. And, the and that would be the very descriptive term in this case of bent. The molecular shape of a central atom with two terminal atoms and one lone pair of electrons is bent. Also, lone pairs of electrons push out a little bit more. There's no positive uh, nucleus on this end to kind of balance out their negative charge. So they take up a little bit more uh, space in this. So these two bonds end up being pushed a little bit closer together just because there's no other positive nucleus up here to counteract the negative charge of that lone pair. So overall, when you have three electron groups around a central atom. It has an electronic geometry of trigonal planar and with a molecular shape of either trigonal planar, if there are no lone pairs, or bent, if there is one lone pair of electrons. When you get to uh, having four electron groups surrounding a central atom, the overall shape ends up being tetrahedral. And now you're seeing the three-dimensional structure of these molecules. They're no longer flat molecules. They're now, they now occur in three dimensions. So the electronic structure for all of these is tetrahedral, while if there is zero lone pairs of electrons, the molecular shape is tetrahedral and the overall bond angle between all of these uh, atoms is 109.5 degrees. That is the geometry of this molecule. If there's one lone pair of electrons that removes one of these atoms, it's not flat, but it's trigonal and the central atom is raised up a little bit like a pyramid. So the molecular shape with one lone pair of electrons is trigonal pyramidal and with two lone pairs of electrons now both of them are gone it ends up still having the same uh, molecular shape as the trigonal planar one where it has one lone pair it's a bent geometry the difference however is that the bond angle is different When you move up to the larger atoms, uh, so in the case where there are five electron groups surrounding it, this is trigonal bipyramidal. So if you take each of uh, this uh, flat part in the middle and there's one on top, one on the bottom, it, all four of these together look like a pyramid and another pyramid on the bottom. So trigonal, three, bi two pyramidal, looks like a pyramid. Uh, this one is unique because in all of the other cases, the order in which you remove electrons if there's a lone pair doesn't matter. But in this one, uh, the lone pairs of electrons end up being on these side atoms or these equator equatorial um, locations. 
So if there's one lone pair of electrons, it ends up being in one of those equatorial locations and the um, molecular shape would be seesaw. So like, uh, like a, on a playground where you have a seesaw or teeter-totter looking, um, looking molecule. Uh, once you have two lone pairs of electrons, again, it's going on the equatorial position. So the overall molecule ends up looking like a T, the letter T, and the chem we chemists are very, very descriptive, and this is known as a T-shaped molecule. And last, if you have three lone pairs of electrons, then it will just be linear. And this is the overall goal. This is why the lone pairs end up in this way, because when you get to this point, now the last two atoms are absolutely as far apart from each other as they possibly could be. The last one we're going to go over is octahedral, where there are six electron groups surrounding the central atom. And uh, again, now they're all equidistant from each other, and it doesn't matter which position ends up being the lone pair first. So if you have one lone pair, it's now square pyramidal. So again, now there's four on the bottom, so with one on top, it looks like a square, and it's a pyramid. Uh, the second lone pair of electrons would go on the opposite side, and that would make it square planar. It's flat, and it's a square. Now, the other two positions, or the other two things, uh, if you have a third lone pair of electrons, it would end up looking like a T, so it would be T-shaped. And if you had four lone pairs of electrons, it would take it off the other side and end up being linear. These two are purely theoretical. Uh, there aren't any known compounds that actually have that shape, but if uh, they were discovered, it would most likely follow that format. Now, throughout all of these VSEPR slides, you may have noticed this term in these tables, the hybridization. And that is for another uh, theory of how electrons or, or how molecules get their shape. And it's based on the molecular orbitals and the subshells. So what this theory term uh, deals with is combining the subshells the S, P, and D subshells to create these hybrid orbitals. These, uh, these orbitals that are a combination or a hybrid of the geometries of these other orbitals. So tetrahedral has, or I'm sorry, starting from the beginning, if you take the one S orbital and one of the p orbitals and combine it, that would end up being an sp hybrid, where this image doesn't do a uh, great justice, but it's a large lobe and then a smaller lobe, and there's two of them combined into this linear shape. Uh, one s orbital and two p orbitals, that would be the sp2 hybrid orbitals, um, because now there's two of the p orbitals, and that would be uh, three separate orbitals li like the p orbital, where the p orbital has three separate uh, shapes combined into that one subshell. Um, the sp2 hybrid orbital is three of those. Again, it's a large lobe and a tiny little small lobe combining together to make a trigonal planar geometry. The tetrahedral geometry combines the S orbital and three P orbitals, so it's SP3. The uh, trigonal bipyramidal combines the S, all three of these P orbitals, and now includes one of the D orbitals. That's why it's able to hold more electrons. Uh, and it ends up being a shape like the uh, trigonal bipyramidal. Uh, 
And then the last one is sp3d2, using two of the d orbitals to create um, these six different uh, subshells to create the octahedral shape. So this is just another uh, theory on how these shapes come to be. One of the last things that I'm going to go over in terms of shape and structure is the polarity of a molecule. Polarity is a very important concept, especially when you get to uh, organic chemistry and upper chemistry, where you're looking to see what types of molecules and how these things interact. Uh, it's also very important in how they're held together, how the overall group of molecules stays together. And the polarity, it can be thought of as a mismatch of the charge. So something that is polar has an area on it that's positive and an area that's negative. So in the case of hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen and nitrogen are on opposite sides of this carbon atom and they are very, very different. There is a tiny little bond right here Hydrogen's only giving it one electron, carbon's giving it one, so there's a little bit of electron right here. And on the opposite side, you have a triple bond between carbon and nitrogen, so there are six electrons over here, and nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. So on this side of the molecule is much more negative than this side of the molecule. So, uh, Again, on this side, there are two, four, six, eight electrons. And on the opposite side of carbon, there are two. That is really what polarity is. It's a mismatch of the charge distribution on the molecule. There are way more, mole or there are way more electrons on one side of the molecule than there are the other. So this is one of the easiest examples to look at. But look, uh, if you go to something like water, where you can see that on this side, if you cut it in half this way, the bottom part has two hydrogens, which are mostly uh, a proton, and the electron is part of the bond, and the oxygen itself has two lone pairs of electrons. In water, this top half of the electron is or of the molecule is very negative, the bottom half is very positive, and it is a very, very polar molecule. Carbon dioxide, individually, these bonds are polar. A carbon and an oxygen are very, very different in how well they hold on to electrons. Oxygen is very, very electronegative. Carbon is middle ground. So the electrons are all drawn towards the oxygen. So the bo this bond itself is polar. However, in carbon dioxide, the molecule is a linear molecule, and it is the same bond on both sides. So the polarity is pulling in this direction, and it's pulling in this direction at the same amount, so they cancel out. And therefore, this molecule would be nonpolar. So a good way to look at whether something is polar or not is drawing uh, through some of these bonds and looking for um, symmetry. If a molecule is symmetrical on one side and the other in each plane you cut it in half, then it is a nonpolar molecule. If there's a mismatch, then it would be a polar molecule. So if I draw a line through um, the molecule of water this way, it's the same. But if I draw it through that way, it's no longer the same. There's a difference. It is not symmetrical. Therefore, it would be a polar molecule. 
So in the experiment itself, you're going to be looking at both nomenclature and chemical geometry, molecular geometry, looking at the shapes of molecules, as well as the naming of a lot of these different compounds and some of the chemical properties. Uh, the lab is separated into five different uh, areas or five different groups of 10 compounds. One group looks particularly at molecular shapes. So in the lab, you will be given 10 different pre-built molecular models, all uh, labeled. So here uh, you'd be given what is the identity of the central atom and what is the identity of the terminal atoms. In this, if you can read that, uh, that image, this one right here says that the black center atom is carbon and the red terminal atoms are oxygen. So from that label, you can determine what is the chemical formula and what is the chemical name. You'll be counting how many of these terminal atoms there are, what is the central atom so you can get the chemical name and the chemical formula. And looking at the shape of the molecular model itself, you can determine the both the molecular shape and the electronic geometry of each of the 10 atoms in lab. Once you have that recorded, you're also going to be choosing five of these 10 atom or five of these 10 molecules and indicating the Lewis structure on your report. In the molecular geometry portion of the experiment, the lab room will have 10 different pre-made molecules in the room. All of these molecules are labeled with what the central atom and what the terminal atoms are. In this case, the yellow central atom is labeled as sulfur and the white terminal atoms are labeled as hydrogen. From this, you can determine what is the chemical formula of this compound as well as its name. Using the molecular model, you can see the molecular geometry or the molecular shape of the molecule. And using your knowledge of chemistry to know where the lone pairs of electrons happen to be, you can also determine the electronic geometry of the shape. Some of the shapes will have the lone pairs of electrons indicate it, while others may not. You will go through and determine the geometries of each of the 10 compounds, both the electronic geometry and molecular geometry, as well as based on the labeling, what is the name and what is the chemical formula for each of these 10 compounds. Probably the largest portion of the lab itself is dealing with a number of different solid materials. So in the lab, there are uh, three groups of 10 solid compounds. And for each one, about half of them are labeled only as the chemical formula. So on your report, you're determining what is the chemical name. The other half are labeled only with the chemical name, and you're determining what is the chemical formula. So that's uh, just changing the, determining the names and the chemical formulas. But in the lab itself, the more experimental portion of this is you're, for each one of these 30 different compounds, you're going to take a very small amount of that and dissolve that in water or try to dissolve that in water. You're going to see, does that compound dissolve when you place it in water? And you're only using a very, very small amount. Um, and that way you can 
kind of get a sense of what types of compounds are soluble, thinking back to uh, the solubility experiment, what types of these compounds are soluble, and noting what the color of all of these compounds are. And each grouping will also have an additional test for it. Things like adding ammonia to anything that dissolves and seeing what uh, the, your observations are. In another group, it could be adding uh, silver nitrate or sodium carbonate, seeing what compounds uh, form precipitates when these two other components are added. So in the lab, you're going through and looking at all 30 of these different compounds. Half have the name, you're indicating the formula. Half have the formula, you're indicating the name. And in lab, you're determining, or getting those observations, getting those chemical uh, observations. What color is it? Can it dissolve in, wa in water? And some other test, which is specific to the different group of chemical compounds. The bulk of the experiment looks at determining the nomenclature of different solid materials. You'll be provided 10 solid materials in three groups. Some of them are labeled with the chemical name and on the lab report you would indicate the chemical formula, while others are la labeled as the chemical formula and you would indicate the chemical name. For all of these compounds, you're also going to be noting what is the color of the material and whether or not the solid compound is soluble in water. To determine this, you'll take a spatula and place a small amount of the solid material in a small test tube. Make sure that your spatula is fairly clean as you're mixing it in between these different uh, containers. You don't want to cross-contaminate all of the different chemicals provided. You can take your spatula and a small chem wipe or piece of paper towel with a small amount of water and make sure that the spatula is relatively clean. You can then take one of the compounds and take a very small amount of material, it doesn't have to be a lot, a very small amount, and add that to a test tube. You can then add some water and see if the solid material dissolves. You would do this for all 30 of the compounds. In addition, each group of 10 compounds also has a secondary test associated with it. In the case of the transition metal compounds, the secondary test is if the compound dissolves and is soluble, you would add a few drops of concentrated ammonia and note any changes in the solution itself. You would do that for all of the transition metal compounds. In the binary compound section, you would again take a small amount of material and add that to a test tube to see if the compound dissolves. And add some water. If the compound is able to dissolve, or at least mostly dissolve, what you can then do is take some amount of your actual solution and place that in a second test tube. You can use a disposable pipette to transfer some of the liquid into a second test tube. 
now you have two test tubes of the dissolved compound. To one test tube, you would add a few drops of silver nitrate solution and see if a precipitate forms. To the other solution, you would add a few drops of sodium carbonate and see if the precipitate forms. On the report form, you would indicate for the dissolved compound, does it precipitate with silver nitrate solution, sodium carbonate solution, or both solutions? The last group of 10 compounds in, uh, in the lab deals with acids and bases. So you're not going to be given the pure solid materials, you're, you're going to be working with solutions. So these are mostly uh, 0.1 molar, but some of them might be less depending on their solubility. And the chemical formula is the only thing you're given, but it's jumbled. All of the oxygens are labeled first, followed by the central atom, and then any hydrogens. And what you're going to be determining is in small test tubes, adding a drop of universal indicator. And this indicator solution changes color depending on the amount of that H plus, the amount of acid. Things that uh, in change into a red or pink color from universal indicator are acids. And things that are change into a blue or a purple color are bases. And so once you determine whether it's an acid or a base, you can then rearrange these compounds into the appropriate uh, for chemical formula. All of the acids would have all hydrogens listed first, followed by the central atom, followed by all oxygens. In a base, the central atom is listed first and the oxygens and hydrogens are grouped together to form hydroxide. So you would have things like um, sodium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, and things like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, looking at what is the level of acid, whether it's an acid or a base, rearranging that formula in the correct format and labeling the correct name. In the acid-base section of the experiment, there are 10 different solutions of either acids or bases. They are labeled in the chemical formula with all of the oxygens in front, followed by the central atom, and then all of the hydrogens. In the lab, you'll be testing each one of these solutions in a small test tube to see if it is an acid or a base. An acid has the hydrogens listed in front, followed by the central atom, and then the oxygens. If it would be a base, the hydrogens and oxygens are grouped together to form hydroxide listed second after the central atom. You'll be using universal indicator and using the chart, you can determine the approximate pH or acidity level of the solution. A red color would indicate an acidic solution, while a blue or purple color would indicate a base. You'll have all, all of your solutions in small test tubes, and then add one drop of the universal indicator solution. In doing so, you can see the different colors of the solutions, seeing 
which ones are acidic and which ones are basic and using the chart to identify what is the acid level. Anything below a pH of 7 is acidic, while anything above a pH of 7 is basic. So in this lab, you're going to be doing a lot of moving around. There's these 10 different uh, sets in the lab. The majority is looking at those solid chemicals. You'll take uh, each one of those materials, determine the chemical name, the chemical formula, see if they're dis uh, able to dissolve in water and perform some other secondary test and record those observations. You're also going to be looking at different pre-built molecular shapes, uh, based on the labeling, what is the name, what is the formula, and based on the molecular model itself, what is its molecular geometry, what is its electronic geometry, and determining of, of those 10 molecules, drawing five Lewis structures. And lastly, looking at some compound, uh, uh, some compounds of acids and bases. These are solutions and your adding a couple of drops of universal indicator just to see is the solution acidic or basic. And you'll rearrange that jumbled chemical formula depending on if it's an acid or a base and indicate the appropriate name. So the bulk of this experiment is actually going to be done in the lab itself and there's not too much in the report after you take down all of the measurements. You're looking at all of these different compounds, uh, 50 different compounds in the lab, and determining uh, either their, both their name and their chemical formula, looking at how these different materials are named. There are three groups of solid compounds that you're looking at to see which ones of these three groups of 10 are soluble in water, looking at what color they are, and some other additional component depending on the group. You're also looking at a number of different uh, solutions of either acid or base, looking to see are they, what are they, is it an acid or a base, rearranging the chemical formula listed on the bottle and writing the name, and identifying molecules based just on their shape, looking at Vesper, looking at their Lewis structures, and seeing what the molecules are just by looking at how the molecules are oriented. By going through this type of an experiment, you're getting a much more hands-on feel for the chemicals themselves and seeing all of these different things that can happen in chemistry.